Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Lord willing, uh, this will be our last week in Romans 8. We have been in it for uh, a number of weeks. It's kind of become its own uh, mini-series. I was informed by... um, one of our sweet ladies earlier this morning that she's been listening to uh, Dr. David Jeremiah. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. If you're not, you ought to be. Uh, one of the premier Bible teachers in our uh, nation. I just love that guy. He's been preaching also a series in Romans 8. I didn't know. I wished I had. I would have stole some of his, his stuff. But he's, he's titled it, it the, the Greatest Chapter in all of the Bible, and I think he may be right. If, we, if, if one was greater than the other, I don't think ultimately it is. It's all the Word of God. Um, but it, it, is, it is so impactful uh, to the New Testament believer what is said here in this chapter. So today, we're going to start in verse 31 where we left off last week, and then we're going to close out the chapter down through verse 39. So Romans 8, 31, if you found it, say Amen. The Bible says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, who should bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37 says, Yet in all these things, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, oh, how we need your touch on our time in here today. Would you speak to us now through the word of God? May it be an anointed time for each and every person in this room, those that are watching online, that we would have an encounter with the Holy Ghost of Jesus. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our text today is focused really in its entirety on the eternal security of the believer. It's a subject, as a matter of fact, that uh, even as a boy in a a quiet church from a quiet town, uh, it would be one of those subjects that seemed to stir up the people of God. It's a subject in which even Baptists on a Sunday morning might smile just a little talking about the blessedness of the security of the believer. And by the way, it's not an old truth. It's a timeless one. Amen. It, It helps the believer to be settled, if you will, to be settled in their relationship with Christ and not live in this constant state of fear when it comes to their eternal destination or who their God really is. It's a game changer. It was a game changer in my own life. My own personal story is that everything changed whenever I got saved and I I discovered how secure I was in Christ. Whenever I came to this place, I didn't have to constantly live wondering of all the the what ifs about my eternity. And I come to the realization that my eternity was not secured because I'd all of a sudden become a good boy. But my my eternal security was there because I now worship a good God. 
as a kid, there's nothing more comforting than to lie down in bed and hear mom or dad say these words, snug as a bug in a rug. Anybody, any of y'all have mom and dads that said that? Snug as a bug in a rug. My kids, now I didn't get that. My mom may have whenever I was real small. She might have tucked me in. My dad's tucking in was, you boys get in the bed. That was, that was dad tucking in, okay? And, and, you know, it was kind of one of those, if you don't go get in the bed, you better, you better duck. Amen. And because, he, he, you know, it's, you obey. But anyway, with our kids, uh, especially whenever they were smaller, our boys have kind of outgrown this, um, uh, but our, our girls still maybe haven't. But they like to be tucked in. They want to know that, hey, mom and dad's still at the watch, right? That, that whenever I lay down to go to sleep, that all is good in the world. No matter what's happening out there, it's good in the house. Why? Because I got tucked in. I'm snug as a bug in a rug. I thought about that all week long as I'm preparing this message that chapter eight of the book of Romans, in a sense, is God telling his children, you're snug as a bug in a rug. All is good. All is settled. All, y'all just sit there and stare at me. It's all good, right? If you know Jesus, he's saying you are secure. You know, it's interesting. I thought also about this after I heard a, uh, and watched an illusionist the other night, um, you know, black magic kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and it was at a preacher's gathering. Uh, <laughs> but he, this illusionist, he, he's really good. But he, he started, he said some things that really got me to thinking. You know, he, he talked about the imagination that we have as, as kids. And man, I'm telling you, I, I had an I had a imagination and a half. I mean, I got like a double dose of imagination as, as a little boy. I mean, I, I, I rode stick horses for miles, amen, and we had rodeos, and, and, and somehow our stick horses turned into bucking bulls, and, and I mean, we just did it all out there with them sticks, and we'd go to war. Uh, our sticks would, our, our bucking bull slash horse would turn into a sword or a gun, and we, you know, we'd, we'd fight out in the woods with them swords, and you had these imaginations, but then there was another kind of imagination that happened whenever you went to bed, before the lights went out, everything seemed to be normal in the room. But something happened when the lights went off. The boogers came out. Didn't y'all have that? I mean, the moment that the lights went out and mom and dad left the room, the boogers came out in the room. All of a sudden, there's a shoebox sitting up there in the windowsill that turns into a troll that's going to come and just eat your soul out from your body. Bef I'm feeling judged. Hey, Amen. Did you not have that? I mean, every, every shape in there, the, the clothes basket all of a sudden looked like a bear and, and everything in there turned into a booger until you yelled at mom, or you didn't yell at dad, but you yelled at mom and uh, she come running in there and flip that light switch on and all of a sudden all the boogers just gone. They're like vampire boogers, amen, and they're gone. They just can't do the light thing. Well, what was happening? What was happening was my imagination. And this, this guy got talking about this this week, and it helped me to realize a truth that I think is, is, is impactful. And he, he kept talking about it. He said, you haven't lost your imagination as an adult. You think you have, but you haven't. You see, as a child, you, you imagine things that, that could be. As a child, you imagine and you dream, and you have this, this wonder about you. This, this Things really make you go, wow. As an adult, however... We've changed that from awe often to fear. You think about it, even in our culture, we're enamored with how we use our imagination to dream up how bad things could get. We dream up how bad. Hey, by the way, if you don't believe that, wait till another election comes around. We use our imagine during an election season and we start these scare tactics on one another to just dream about how bad it could get. The world's gonna come crashing down. It's all gonna blow up. It's all, and by the way, it doesn't matter if it's a donkey or an elephant. We're all, we've got our imaginations running wild. 
And instead of using that imagination as an adult to put faith and trust in a God who does the impossible, we choose to channel it in towards things like fear about what we think might be possible. What God's doing in our text today is helping us to understand that all things are possible with him. And they are, and we can be secure in that. Why? Because we're not working for a position with Jesus. You you get that right. We're not working for a position with Jesus. We talked about that last week. We are positioned in Christ. That's our position. And now he comes this week to help us to understand, here's what I've done to help you to stand strong in that position, stand secure. Number one, I'm just gonna give you a list of these. If you'll listen quick, I'll get through them all. If you don't listen quick, I'll still get through them all, just take a lot longer. Deal. Number one, God is for us. This is a, this, this is a biggie. I, 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 I almost got here with it last week. But God is for us. Look at verse one or 31. What then should we say to, to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What we learned last week was that not only is he working for us, but just at the core of who he is, he is for us. That, you cannot overstate how important this is. He's in our corner. He's on our team. He's behind us. He's beside us. He's out front leading us. He's cheering for us. He's watching over us. He is He's saying we're in the family. What a big deal. We're in the family. And you guys realize once you're in the family, they just take you warts and all. Amen? That's just part of it. I mean, family's going to have some warts. Amen? If you don't think your family's got warts, you may be it. <laughs> I, you could be. I don't know. I'm not making a statement. I'm just saying could be. I remember when Bets and I started dating. Um, I, I can't tell you the day it happened, but I can tell you that it happened. There was a moment in time, not all that long before we got married, that I, I kind of got... I'm in the family. Now, I went with her for a long time, partly because her grandma was such a good cook and we got to go over there every Sunday afternoon, amen, bless God, and she fed me good. But there was a time in which I, I went from being just, oh yeah, that's Chastity's boyfriend, or you know, big hunk of hunk of burning love to, <laughs> he's in. He's, they, did, they treated me different and they didn't ever treat me bad. Never one time did they treat me bad. But there was a difference whenever I was now in the family. I didn't change my last name. That would have been weird, amen. <laughs> but they brought me in. I thought about that this week as I'm, I'm reading through this text. This is what God's saying. You're, you're in my family. You remember last week, he talked about us being one of, of many brethren. And this is a position we don't think of with Jesus often, but he is also, he's our elder brother. And he's saying, we're family now. By the way, talk about, uh, this just meant so much to me because there's an old saying where I come from that you can, you can talk about anybody you want to, but don't mess with my, what? My family. And by the way, I talk about my family, amen? But y'all better not mess with my family, There's something about being in the family. And here's what Paul's giving to us here. He's like, honestly, what what else are y'all needing if you know that God is for you? You know, it doesn't take long. I've learned this over the years in in conversation, face-to-face conversation, to find out whether or not somebody's for you. Have you noticed that? You, You can read facial expressions. You can read body language. You can read tone and tood, amen? You, you, somebody comes up to you and they're talking to you and they're, they're talking like this here. They're, they're, they're saying something's wrong. They're saying, hey, I'm guarded. They're saying, hey, I'm protecting something, okay? But body language matters, all this. And here, here's, here's what I, I'm, I'm going, where I'm going. Everything he's done, body language, the, the, the tone of the text, 
The words here on the page, the actions in which he's taken, all of it is God saying, I am for, do you get it yet? I'm for you. That, that blessed me all week. I prepared this message this week in a hotel room. I've been on the road this week. And uh, I, I skipped my conference two or three times to come back and dig into this text because I, I, I can't get over this truth. God is for me. Here's the second one. Jesus died for us. Verse 32. You see the text says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? Here's what he's doing. He's making, he's making the most extreme comparison of God, sending his, his absolute best when he sends his son to us, and saying, how absurd now would it be for him to withhold that which you need to live? Th think about that. I've given you my absolute best, but yet I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold from my own ability to pour into your life good things. He, he described it this way, Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I say to you, do not worry. This is Jesus talking. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on. He said, is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of those. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore don't worry, saying what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you, isn't that that's a good word? Your heavenly Father knows you need those things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What is all these things? All that whole list. And then all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Our culture is enamored with worrying in the entire chapter of chapter 8. It's God saying, would you stop already? I love you. I love you. I'm for you. I gave my best for you. Number three, God justifies us. Verse 33, he said, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. I think it's one of the most, maybe one of the most comforting statements in the, the whole of the Bible. It is God who justifies it's God who justifies. He didn't send an angel to do it. He didn't send uh, some priest or, or father or, or pastor to do it. He sent him, himself, it is God who justifies. And so here's, here's the, the take home from this. If it's God who justifies, then we can rest assured that there will never be a day in which God would condemn that which he justified. Think through this even just logically. God would justify my sweet bride, but then turn around and then condemn her? That makes no sense. He'd condemn his own justification. In other words, what he's saying is, this is complete. This is final. I put my stamp on you. I, I, I've, I've, I've branded you here with my grace. And what God has justified will always forever be justified. Well, what preacher? What, what, what about if I feel condemned? Well, your feeler's broke. And, and again, hang on, I haven't said this. The presupposition is that you're saved. You see, none of this is for the lost person. None of this is for somebody who's just religious. All of this is a word given to the believer, the born again child of God. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're not, if you're not saved, we're gonna give you opportunity to be saved in just a little, little while. It, a great day to be saved, amen? There's not a better day to get saved. 
But he's saying this here to believers. And so as a believer, what preacher, if, well, why do I feel condemned? Well, the Bible speaks to it. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Listen to me, the enemy stands faithful to bring accusation and condemnation against the believer. He does this constantly. The Bible says day and night. He never stops. He's relentless. This truth, man, fired me up this week knowing that, yeah, look, look back over my, my own life and, and certainly since I've been a pastor, I'm gonna make a statement that'll shock some of you. I, I've had critics. Isn't that shocking? I know. Uh, what could they possibly criticize? Um, I have, but here's, here's what's interesting. And I, I've had some that really felt, you know, like called of God to put here on earth to criticize me. Um, but you know, there, there's, there's never been a critic that's tougher on me than, I'm on, than I am on me. There, there's, just, there's, there's been days that I've been so put out with me. Anybody relate with that? Am I the only guy in the room? I'm just telling you, there's just days I'm just sick of me. It's like, pfft. I wish I had a new me to put up with today. You know, just tired of me. Sometimes the enemy uses that against us. He knows our, our weakness. He knows our struggle. Yet this to be a true statement, I want you to hear this. Though our experience as a believer will change, it, 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 it changes from time to time. Our hearts and our attitudes change. They shift from time to time. Other people will accuse us, condemn us. There's times that we will condemn or accuse ourselves. Listen to this statement. God never will. If I'm a child of his, he will never come with accusation. He will never come with condemnation. Why? Jesus paid it all. That's why. Why would he come and accuse us of something that his own precious son bled and died for? No one can bring charge against you as a child of God. They can, can't come and do, deem you to be a, a failure or a flop. They can't come and say, well, you're helpless or you're a detriment. They can't come and, and say you're a shame or even a sinner. They can't come and say you're lost, unworthy, or unusable. Why? Because God has declared you worthy. God has justified you through the blood of his son. And here's the truth. Man's not your judge. Man is not your judge. And if man is not your judge, man has not the final say on your eternity. That ought to bless somebody because there's been some of you in here, guarantee you, feel like, man, folks have judged me. If you give your heart to Jesus, you take the power away from them. You hearing what I'm saying? If you give your heart to Jesus, you take the power away from them. Why? They don't get the final say. God does not judge his elect. He doesn't lay sin to their account, shame to their account. Why? He looks upon them and says, that's my child. No matter how much we've struggled, no matter how much we've suffered through shame in this world, God delivers us. No matter how far we've slid, no matter how far we, we have fallen, God picks us up. No matter how discouraged we are, no matter it, how much we've, we've just royally messed up, we have a God, listen to me, who delights in rescuing us. He doesn't leave us down and defeated. He doesn't go around charging us. He justifies us and continues his work of forgiveness and grace in our life. The reminder, the Scriptures say that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Number four, Jesus arose for us. He arose victorious over the grave. Verse 34, this, the middle part of it, after it says that Christ who died, and it said this, and furthermore, I like that part, and furthermore, he arose. That's a good furthermore, amen? And furthermore, he arose. If you take that out, You've stripped us of the power of the gospel. 
Snatch that one statement out. You've stripped us of the power of the gospel. Why? Because then he would have just been another guy dying for a good cause. But he wasn't just another guy dying for a good cause. He was the God man who died for the sins of the world. And on the third day, as he said he would, he steps out of that grave victorious over death, hell, and the grave. There's only one risen Savior. His name is Jesus. He's not just a man. He is the God man. He's the king of glory. He's the bright and morning star. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. The Bible says he is the great I am. Number five. And I know you're nervous right now because I rarely count past three. There's a lot in this text. Old preachers used to say this, this passage is pregnant with truth. Jesus is exalted for us. He's exalted for us. Look at the same verse. After it says that he has arisen, uh, also is, who is even at, listen to this, at the right hand of God. Christ has been exalted for us. Well, what does that do? He, we, we understand he's ascended. We understand he's at the right hand of God. What does that do for us? I think a couple things it does for us. Number one, it gives us a picture of what is to come for us. This Jesus that is sitting there face to face with God is a picture of what you and I one day as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, will also experience. There's coming a day our faith will be no more because we will be eye to eye with Almighty God himself. To see him face, think about that. The God that you've lived for, longed for, you've prayed to, that you, you've clung to deep in the night. One day, faith will become sight. I, I can't wait for that. I get to read in passages like we find over in the Thessalonian letters. It says that there's coming a day that the, the trumpet of God will sound, the voice of the archangel. And it says that the dead in Christ will rise. Those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. And thus we shall forever be with the Lord. We're going to be the seeing him face. I mean, on the way up, can you imagine the shouting and the dancing on clouds that's going to be happening on the way up? Amen. My soul, there ain't going to be no arm folding on the way up to glory. There's not going to be any pouting on the way up to glory. There's not going to be any fussing and fighting on the way up to glory. Eyes on Jesus, shouting, glory, I can't believe I made it. Amen. Because I'm not going because I did something. I'm going because Jesus did something. Was that the first thing? It was. Second thing. It gives us this picture that he's, he's above it all. He is sovereign, but he's also sovereignly seated by the Father. Now think about that for a second. He is the ruler who reigns over all. He possesses all might, all power, all wisdom, all truth. He sees all, knows all, and yet he's everywhere. What are you worried about? Because this is the same God who is for you, in your corner, rooting for you, cheering for you, enabling you, empowering you, comforting you. I mean, we could go on. And he's exalted for you. Number six, Jesus is interceding for us. Same verse. It's a kind of a pregnant little verse, isn't it? who also makes intercession for us, makes intercession for us. It is Christ Jesus, listen to this. It is Christ Jesus who brings us to God, who makes redemption happen, who makes the forgiveness of sins possible. It is Jesus who brings us to the Father. Now you think about this for a second. You, you've had moments in your life where Somebody you knew was speaking to somebody else about you. And you were kind of iffy and on the fence as to whether or not it was good. You ever been there? Now, don't you point at anybody, but if you've been there, you raise your hand straight up. Okay, don't even angle it towards anybody, but you've been there, amen. Yeah. That's kind of an uneasy feeling, isn't it? You know they're talking. 
And you know they're talking about you. And you really wish that you had like miracle ear, amen? To hear in, listen in, because you'd like to insert some points about you, amen? You'd like to say, hey, I got a, I got a bone to pick. I got something I want to insert there. Y'all didn't get over my best points yet. All they're doing is talking about my bad. I got a couple good. And it's a sick feeling. I thought about that this week because I've, again, shocker, I've had some folks say some nasty stuff about me. Aren't you blown away by that? I can't believe they would. I'd be a liar to say there weren't times that it really bothered me. There, there's times that that was going on and I knew it and it bothered me. There was times it was going on and it was happening. I knew it and, and, and I, didn't, I didn't rest well over it. I wanted to run. You ever wanted to run and defend yourself? You, like like they, they just don't know all I know. It's so good about me. You praise God they don't know all that you know that's bad about you. Amen. God gave me a word several years ago. Some of you know this because you were, you're here. Not many of you were, but maybe a, maybe a sprinkling of you in here. Uh, my first three and a half years here, I really, I really should have got combat pay. It, it was tough. It, it was just tough. And some, just, we went through some tough times. You say, did you do everything right? Heaven snow. I didn't do everything right. No way. But there, there were days in there that I so bad wanted to go defend myself. As things would be said, and I wanted to run over there and set the record straight. You, you, anybody relate with what I'm saying? Like, you just don't know. I think God gave me as clear a word during those days as I've ever had from him, ever. Here's, here's what I felt like I, I got from God. Didn't hear an audible voice, don't, don't get off into that. Here's what I sense God was saying. Chad, if, if, if you'll work to protect your integrity, I will give you a reputation if you need one. And every word of that was critical. If you need one. He wasn't telling me that I needed a reputation. Because by the way, that's what you want to protect, right? That's what you want to run and defend. You want to run and defend your reputation. Well, what is a reputation? Reputation is what everybody thinks about you. What's integrity? What God knows about you. Now just remember that sick feeling going, oh, I'm telling you, my reputation would be so much stronger if they'd let me in and just tell them all my accolades. Oh, how sweet I am. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, sweetie. I don't know why I thought of that, but I did this week preparing this text because this text got, you ever just get in your Bible and your Bible got in you? This one got in me. And it dawned on me, reading this, he's interceding for us. You'll never ever, listen to me, you'll never have to worry or wonder what Jesus is saying to the Father about you. Ever. On your worst day. You may be having that right now, I don't know. Because I get disappointed in me. I get sick with me. And on that day, I don't worry about what the Son is saying to the Father. Why? He's for me. He died for me. He justifies me. He lifts me up, picks me up, cleans me up, sets my feet on the solid rock. Says, you're forgiven. Let's go again. I just wish I had a couple Pentecostals in the room. Amen. <laughs> Golly. Number last, seven. Right on time. Whatever that means. Verse 35 down through verse 39. I believe is screaming. Three words, I love you. This whole text, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a, another sermon in this that we may come back to one day, but this entire section is described in the very last verse. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. 
It's only the the perfect, enduring love of God that keeps him near our side through our tribulation, through our distress, through persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, he says. No matter how lonely you feel, nor how hard or difficult life has become, listen to it. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is near. The Bible declares in Psalm 46, he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. That means he is always there. And I, I think I'm probably talking to some folks that once in a while, just once in a while, you feel like he's a thousand, maybe a million miles away. Anybody? I pray. And man, I, I feel like that didn't even get out of my office, much less to heaven. Let me remind you, he's in the office with you. Y'all okay? I prayed and I didn't feel like it got out of my car. Let me remind you, he's in the car with you. I pray and I didn't feel like I got out of the pit with my prayers. Let me remind you, he's the God in the pit with you. He loves you, irregardless of where you are, irregardless of what you've done. Listen to me, I don't know who needs it. Maybe it's just, I'm trying to preach myself happy this week. He loves you, he's for you. And he wants you to walk in relationship with him. I feel like I'm trying to land a plane up here. Let me close this. Your circumstances are not evidence that God doesn't love you. They're not evidence that God doesn't love you. Listen to me. Nowhere in his his word does God ever say, get saved for the gravy life. Yet somehow we've translated, expect persecution, expect tribulation, expect trial. We've translated that to get saved and enjoy the gravy life. Amen. I, we, do, it's like, we, we just reject any notion that life could get hard. We reject any notion that life could bring about persecution. Any notion that life could get difficult. Listen to me, I've, I've been saying this for the last few weeks. Hey, this thing's gonna pass away, y'all get that, right? This world will not last forever. There's one thing that lasts forever, that's souls. That's it. Jesus is in the soul business. He's about loving people. And it's interesting. The tougher it gets on people, the more serious that they get about God. We don't do real well with the gravy life, do we? And I'm I'm talking to somebody out here that's going, bless God, I'd like to try. Never had gravy. You have no idea how good you've got it, ma'am or sir. You have no idea. If you're living here in God blessed America, oh my soul, you have no idea how good you have it. To just be born as a citizen of this nation, to live in the freest nation in the world, in the history of the world. Yeah, I understand. It's your problems. and I understand that they're they're painful for you. I get that. But listen to me. Ma'am, sir, there is a God in heaven that desperately wants a relationship with you. He wants to walk daily with you. And here's what he's saying. You can be secure in that. Secure, as snug as a bug in a rug.